Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's great pleasure for me uh, to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Michelle Thaler. is an astrophysicist with over two decades of science communication experience. Her research involved the life cycle of stars, and she has worked at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA headquarters, and the Goddard Space Flight Center, where she is currently the liaison between the Office and uh, of Communication and the Science Directorate. Outside her work at NASA, she has appeared on many television science programs, including How the Universe Works and Space Deep Side Secrets. Michelle has done two TEDx uh, talks about astronomy and has hosted the podcast Orbital Path on Public Radio. Uh, she, she is uh, going to talk to us about uh, the astronomy and especially uh, the James Webb Telescope, uh, neutron star, and uh, many, many subjects on astronomy. Uh, we know that the James Webb Telescope space, uh, space Telescope is currently taking its first image of the universe, ranging from observation of the other planet and our solar system, uh, to planets around the other stars, all the way to the very first stars and galaxies that formed. We will talk a look at the groundbreaking technology of this telescope and look ahead to the discovery we accept as well as one we have not even guessed. Uh, welcome, welcome uh, Dr. Michel, uh, and uh, you can start now. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It is a, a, a big honor to be here. I, uh, I, I would love to, uh, to come to Morocco. I was, I was just speaking to our host saying I've, I've been to, um, to Egypt and to Libya, but I've never been to Morocco and I would really, really love to come. And uh, um, of course, the, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is an international collaboration. It's, it's not just NASA that's involved. Uh, we have big collaboration, collaborators in, in Canada and in Europe. But uh, NASA collaborates with uh, people all over the world. Uh, we do uh, also a lot of work with the Indian Space Agency, and we we just signed a, a big agreement with the United Arab Emirates. So there, there, you know, everything that we do is is a, a world project. It's it's, it's not just uh, the United States. I'm I'm very proud of that. So the James Webb Space Telescope launched uh, on December 25th of uh, of last year. And uh, this was after um, nearly 25 years of working on it. You know, I, I have friends who have worked on this for a very, very long time. My husband was an engineer on this uh, on this telescope. He'd be very proud of it. And uh, and so today I'll show you a bit about the the technology and the science goals of the telescope. And then we can talk about many things. I, I have many slides I can show you. And um, after uh, I give my talk. I'm happy to answer questions about anything. So, it, I mean, it doesn't have to be just about the James Webb Telescope. If you have any questions about NASA or our recent discoveries, uh, you know, one of the good things about my job at NASA is I, I read pretty much all of the, the new results that come out. So I may not be an expert in everything, but I, I probably know about what's happening. So feel, feel free to, to ask. So I'm going to share my screen and start my slides. So just uh, hold on for a second there. Okay. And uh, let me start my slides now. Okay. Let me know if there's any problem with the slides and I will, uh, I'll, I'll see if we can fix that. Okay, so the James Webb Space Telescope, as I mentioned, um, this comes from a, a long line of, uh, of space observatories. Of course, the, the Hubble Space Telescope is probably the most famous other one. Um, when I was a, a young astronomer, I worked at the California Institute of Technology on the Spitzer Space Mission, which was a, a small telescope, just about a meter mirror across. Uh, but uh, it uh, it also was an infrared mission. So this is this is something that I've been working on uh, since the the mid 1990s. And um, the uh, this shows you some of the scale of the uh, the mirrors. Here's one of our scientists, uh, Sylvia, and uh, this is the Hubble mirror, about about two and a half meters. And then there's the the Webb meter, about about six and a half meters. And as you can see, the the James Webb Space Telescope mirror is in segments. 
there are 18 hexagonal segments. And uh, this, uh, this, a mirror of this size, there is no rocket available that could launch the mirror fully unfolded. So this, this was an amazingly risky telescope because we built the entire observatory to fold up and then it had to unfold once we got out into space. So, you know, very, very uh, ambitious and, 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 and risky. And, and I can tell you that in my home, a lot of sleep was lost over this telescope and whether it would work. And, and of course, we're, we're so happy. So in terms of the size of the spacecraft, again, a comparison between Webb and Hubble. And the, uh, the two spacecraft are actually not that different. Uh, it's a, just a very different design that Webb emphasizes the mirror, the, the, the big, big mirror compared to Hubble. And um, as you can see, there is no protective tube to keep the, the mirror dark, like Hubble, like a, like a classical telescope, a big tube that actually protects the mirror. So the, the design of Webb was different in the sense that the mirror is just open to space. We do expect there to be some, you know, damage from micrometeorites, hopefully not much. And uh, the, uh, the whole uh, observatory mirror is kept dark because of a heat shield, a, a shield of heat and light that you can see I'm pointing to here. And, and this is actually a very, very, uh, very thin layers. It's of a material, uh, it's, it's called captain. It's like mylar. So very, very, you know, almost paper thin, five of them. Just, just the, the separation of five of these layers actually produces a, a very effective heat shield. So, and, and again, this heat shield had to be rolled up and unfolded when you were in space. So the, the wavelength that the James Webb Space Telescope looks at is what we call infrared light. And um, infrared, I'm sure you know, is, is not light that our eyes can see. It, it's invisible to us. And so you, you see here a depiction of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is all of the different colors of light, all the different energies of light that exist. The, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, could see it was mostly uh, designed to look at the visible spectrum, the type of light that our eyes see. It did see a little bit into ultraviolet, a little bit into infrared. And then uh, you can see that the, the, the Spitzer Space Telescope here, uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope, uh, which launched in 2003 and then just ended a few years ago, uh, could see well into the infrared, almost out to microwave. And so the James Webb Space Telescope is, is sort of what we would call the, the, the near infrared to the, the middle infrared. And there are some, some very, very specific advantages of using infrared. Um, I mean, one that's relatively obvious is that infrared uh, is often something that we think of as heat, heat radiation. And so objects that are warm, but are, are not glowing like a star, a star is so hot, it's glowing in visible light. But a planet is not that hot, but it gives out infrared radiation. There are many more objects in the universe that are warm, but not glowing hot. So in, in infrared, you see many, many more objects. But you also have some very uh, striking advantages. Um, this is a picture of a, a cloud of dust and gas that is actually uh, trillions of miles across, or I should say, I should say at least hundreds of billions of miles across. And uh, um, inside this cloud, there are many stars that are forming. This is part of the Eagle Nebula. And the, uh, uh, the people who first saw this, this image from Hubble called it the, the pillars of creation because there are stars and solar systems forming inside this cloud. The, uh, the, the tiniest little bumps on this cloud are, are bigger than our solar system. And at the top of each of these pillars, there are, are stars actively forming. So, so stars form when, when hydrogen and dust all come together under the force of gravity. And then eventually all of that pressure heats up the interior and nuclear fusion begins. But to study star formation, the process happens inside these clouds, dusty, it's, it's obscured. So infrared, this is a, a real image, I'll play this. Um, we're going to switch now to uh, an, an, an infrared image taken by one of Hubble's instruments that looked a little bit into the infrared. 
And this is this is the image that, that they took there. And uh, you can see how much is missing in the visible light. You know, all of those stars are real. All of them are, are there in space. But the cloud, the gas, just simply absorbed all of that light from the stars coming. It's, uh, it's not even just the stars that form inside the cloud, but here you're looking at other stars in our galaxy that are very far away from us, but now we can see their light coming through the dust of that cloud. So in, in infrared, you can see, simply put, more objects in general, objects that are warm, but you can also see through obscuring dust. And then the, the other big advantage of the infrared is that as the universe expands, light from distant galaxies is actually stretched out by the expansion of the universe. It's called the cosmic redshift. And for very, very distant galaxies where there has been a lot of expanding space between us and the galaxy, uh, you can have the light shifted all the way out of visible light into infrared. So we have a chance to actually see farther out into the universe. Literally, we can see farther away using infrared because the light that gets stretched out by the expansion of the universe is now in the infrared. It may have started billions of years ago as ultraviolet light from very young stars, but now it's been stretched out all the way into the infrared. And so it's, it's this reason that we, uh, we really hope to see uh, evidence of the first stars and galaxies forming. Obviously, the, the, the longer you look away, you know, the, the longer the light took to get to you. And so we're, we're hoping to see very early back into the, into the universe. To give you a sense of how far back, uh, again, a comparison of Webb and Hubble. So we start at the present day and uh, we, we want to actually, here, I'll, I'll play this. There we go. Hopefully it'll play now. <laughs> there we go. Play. <laughs> well, let me try that again. For some reason, for some reason that, that particular one didn't want to play, but I'll, there we go, Web and Hubble. So we start out today with, with visible light. And of course we can see objects around us in visible light. But as we look farther and farther back into the history of the universe, we go more toward infrared. And for some reason, this one is having a little trouble, but I, I'll just move it myself. <laughs> so Webb can see, you know, ab ab about the time that modern galaxies form, you know, um, we Webb can see to ab about, you know, maybe say 500 million years after the Big Bang. But, but Webb, we actually hope there we go, 500 million years after the Big Bang. But, but Webb, we actually really hope, is going to see much farther than that. Now it'll play. The, uh, the very first galaxies are forming around about 200 million years after the Big Bang. And then there is a, a chance. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, we're not sure how much we'll be able to see of the very first stars. So, so here's about the limit that we think we can get back with the Webb telescope, seeing about 200 million years after the Big Bang. And um, we, can, we can talk a little bit more about why the very first stars might be difficult to see, because that has to do with what the entire universe was like at that time. The, the gas between the stars was very different than the way it is now. So there's the Webb telescope being constructed. And uh, this was a, a wonderful part of my life. The main observatory, and here you see us assembling on a robotic arm, the mirrors, this was done where I work at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And then we had to test it. This is a centrifuge to make sure it will stand up to the, the, the gravity of launch. And we also put it on a big table to shake it to make sure that it would survive the launch. And then uh, another test that we did at Goddard that I, I had, uh, I, you know, I was able to actually watch this testing happen. We put it into a, a chamber that has a very high level of sound. It sounds so high, you can see 110 decibels. That would kill you. That's actually a, a fatal level of sound. Uh, and the, the, and there were the, those small vibrations, again, to make sure that it would survive launch. We had to fly Webb to Houston, Texas, to put it into a giant vacuum chamber. And this vacuum chamber not only could suck out all the air, it could get it down to the correct temperatures the, uh, the operating temperature of uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is ah, it's in Celsius, I, I think about minus 250 degrees. So, you know, only about 25 degrees above absolute zero. And of course, the, the mirror segments 
the mirror segments are made of a metal called beryllium. And beryllium holds its shape very well at different temperatures. But you put it down to 250 degrees Celsius below zero, it will change its curvature a little. And so the, the mirror segments were made so that they are only at the correct focus at the low temperature. And so we did these optical tests to make sure that at that temperature, the surfaces were the right curvature. So that was some of the testing that uh, I had a chance to actually observe. Uh, and uh, that was really exciting. And, uh, and, and then, of course, we had to take it to our main aerospace collaborator, Northrop Grumman, the company. Uh, they were the ones that built the heat shield. And then so we had to put all of that together, the observatory and the heat shield. And then once that was all together, uh, it was, it was, it was uh, as you can see here, was ready to be moved to launch. The, uh, here we are loading it onto the C-5 aircraft, a huge aircraft that's hollow inside. And, uh, and this was where it went off to California. And so to Northrop Grumman, here we are at Northrop Grumman, and uh, the testing is being done. As you can see, the telescope is folded up. The heat shield is folded up. And, uh, and whenever, when all the testing was done, it's ready to go to South America. We launched from French Guiana. That is the European launch site in, in South America. And so here it is being closed up in its, its portable clean room, no dust, uh, a nitrogen atmosphere, constant temperature. And, uh, and here we are in Los Angeles loading it. We're, we're taking it to the, uh, the, the shipping docks and it'll be put on a ship. So uh, of course we did this at night because the traffic is always bad in Los Angeles. Uh, and, uh, and here it is arriving at the port, uh, ready to go to, to French Guiana. And I think the, the next video has a little bit of sound, but it, it's the arrival in, in French Guiana. So I'll play that. So quite a journey. And then, uh, you know, on, on December 25th in the morning, um, we had an absolutely perfect launch on an Ariane 5 rocket. So uh, this is the uh, the largest lift vehicle we have at the moment. The, uh, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope was the largest, the most massive single payload ever launched on this rocket. The, um, this rocket usually launches more than one satellites at a time. And, uh, and so it was not a particularly heavy lift for this rocket, but it was the largest single lift that it's ever done. And uh, that, that caused some interesting problems at the spaceport. This was something, again, that um, my family worked on, that uh, um, we originally were going to fly the, the spaceship down in the C-5 airplane, but it, it, it was a very, very large single satellite. And we found out that the bridges that they had constructed, the bridges over the rivers, couldn't take the weight of the James Webb Space Telescope. So good good thing we, we checked that. <laughs> and so, but the launch was, was absolutely perfect. Um, there had been thunderstorms the day before. And so we didn't know if it was going to go or not. And then this was a, a moment of, of real joy for me when it launched. The, uh, the rocket performed so well. It, it, it put us in exactly the right path to space that we were able to save a lot of fuel uh, we originally thought we would have to fire some rockets 
some guidance rockets to get into just the right path. But the launch was so perfect, we didn't have to do that. So uh, that, that's good for the lifetime of web. We saved our fuel for guidance. And so that will allow us to operate longer. And this is an, an amazing uh, image for me. I mean, this is, this is the real image of, uh, as you can see, the James Webb Space Telescope being released from the rocket. And uh, the uh, ESA had a camera on the Ariane 5. And, and that's incredible to me. After, after 25 years and seeing this uh, right in front of my eyes at, at, uh, at Goddard, uh, to actually see that now heading out to space to its uh, its orbit um about a, in, a, we, we say this in miles i apologize for that uh, you know scientists always use kilometers but it, it's about a million miles away going to the uh the second lagrange point past the moon and i'll i'll show you some animation of that beautiful image of the earth there and uh, what you can see happening is um uh, a little bit of those guidance rockets firing but but just a little bit and then, uh, and pretty soon, the, the first thing we were worried about is now could it generate its own power? We had to extend a solar shield, so you know, a, a, you know get the uh, the power generation. So uh, you can see the, the I shouldn't say the solar shield, a solar panel to uh, to do the power generation. And uh, that was the first thing we saw as soon as it launched from the rocket. You can see here, there's the solar panel deploying, and so we knew very soon that we had electricity and now everything could start. So now what happens is a bit of a race because the telescope is going to be going farther and farther away from the earth and it's going to be getting cooler and cooler and cooler. It has to unfold. Everything unfolding will go easier if the telescope is still warm. You know, it, as it gets colder and colder and colder, there are motors that have to run and there are heaters on those motors but they would take more energy to heat the motors. So as soon as one thing went well, okay, our, our, you know, our solar panel's out. Okay, next thing, do the next thing as quickly as we can, and then make sure that went well, and then do the next unfolding. And so what, as we go out to our orbit around L2, we wanted to do everything as quickly as we could, because the warmer, the better, the, the less risk. So here's the orbit that we're going to, uh, the, uh, the Lagrange point is a balance between the gravity, the sun and the earth and the moon on one side, centripetal force on the other side. And it's a very convenient place to put spacecraft because you don't need much fuel to keep them there. There's a, there's a, a stable point of gravity. And we've used this point before. We, we've used uh, this for different observatories for decades. So a lot of our uh, work on the microwave background radiation, the spacecrafts were at L2. So we, we've, we've definitely sent spacecraft here before. And um, Webb was going out to this about four times farther than the moon. And it'll just gently orbit around this, 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 this point of gravity about one, once every 168 days. So that's the orbit we were going out to. Uh, this is an animation. And you can see that the idea is Always keep the heat shield pointed toward the sun and the earth. Those are the warm things. You don't want the infrared telescope seeing that. And then always have the cold part looking out. And, and while there is part of the sky at any time we can't look, over the course of a year, we can see the whole sky. So we're always looking out from the sun and looking out into the coldness of space. And the heat shield here you can see in this animation deployed the heat shield always faces in towards the warm sun, the warm earth. And because the observatory never sees that light, it can naturally cool down to being very, very cold. So how cold? It's, it's amazing. I mean, just, just, those, just those five layers of very thin material. Uh, the hot side operates at about 85 degrees Celsius. It's quite warm. And, and this is also the side where we communicate to the earth. It's where we have our, 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 our you know, radio and microwave dish that actually gives the signals back to the earth. And as you can see, it's a 21.2 it's a meter heat shield, very, very large, but on the cold side down to minus 233 degrees Celsius. And uh, the instruments can get even colder still, but just, just the, the operating temperature of the, the, the full mirror uh, will just naturally cool to that. So if the, the, the observatory itself is not cooled with any cryogen, there's no liquid helium or hydrogen, 
there is one instrument that has uh, an electric cooler to go a little bit colder still. And uh, that's called the MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument. And uh, that successfully cooled all the way down last week. So that's, uh, that's a, a wonderful thing. Okay, here, here's what made me nervous for the last 10 years. Um, this heat shield has to work. You know, if the heat shield doesn't unfold, you can't reach the temperature that you need to make the observatory work. So if, if this heat shield didn't unfold, it's a piece of space junk. It doesn't work at all. None of the instruments work. And of course, you can see here at Northrop Grumman, there were many tests. Uh, sometimes the tests failed. <laughs> sometimes the tests tore something. I mean, it was, it was really kind of nerve wracking. And um, this is how many mechanisms. So there were 140 little things that had to release and pull, uh, 70 hinges, eight different motors. And again, the motors run better when they're warm than when they're cold. And it, it just, it's unbelievable. So, you know, 400 pulleys, you know, every single one of these things had to work. There was no redundancy. If, if a single one of these little pins didn't come out or a wire didn't pull right, then it, it wouldn't have, the, 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 the heat shield would not have worked as efficiently. So um, I will be honest, when I first saw this design, I thought it was too risky. I, I did not like this design, but um, incredibly, and this gives you the idea of the emotion, you know, and the drama for us, everything worked. And I, I told you it was a race, you know, do this quickly, you know, while, while things are still warm. So we, 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 you know, we deployed the, the solar panel. Good. Okay. Now start unfolding this. Now start unfolding that. Good, good. Everything worked and everything kept working perfectly until we all just like, like, like literally fell over. We did, did one thing that worked, go on to the next thing that worked. Okay. Next thing. And so finally, after about three days, they made us all go home and sleep. And, uh, and then they brought us all back <laughs> when we were a little recovered and it was apparent that everything was working very well. Now, the next thing that has to happen after the heat shield is the mirror has to actually unfold too. And so there, as you can see here in this illustration, there's a central mirror uh, segment, and then there are wings that have the rest of the mirror that have to come out. And then this is the secondary mirror that focuses the light that has to come out as well. So again, those all have to work. And so here is a test of the secondary mirror. You can get a sense of how big it is. And as you can see, it's sped up. So this moves very slowly. So the, the next thing we had to do is make sure that came and, and correctly moved out in front. And here you can see in testing, moving out the sides of this. And then they have the heat shield again. I mean, of course we rehearsed this many, many times. And, uh, and there, there, it, it's a beautiful observatory. And there we see it all, uh, all ready to go into space. <laughs> the mirror segments, as I mentioned, are made of beryllium metal. And uh, that's chosen because beryllium is very strong at uh, low temperatures. They're coated with gold. And gold is a very, very good reflector for infrared light. There's not much gold. Uh, in, on the entire telescope, the, the gold layer is only a couple hundred atoms thick. And so uh, the, the gold is equivalent to, I think someone said, you know, about, uh, about three gold rings. If you have a, a gold ring, it's about three of those over the whole observatory, just a couple hundred atoms thick. On the back of the mirror, to make the mirrors as light as we could, because we were launching into space, so you want to make it uh, light, we drilled a honeycomb. We drilled these, these triangles out just to, just to lose mass. And, uh, and then there's some wonderful technology. On the back of each mirror, there are actuators that, that can push and pull the mirror, tiny, tiny amounts. And then the whole mirror itself can actually swing in many, dim in many dimensions. So unlike the Hubble mirror, where famously it was the wrong curvature, with the Webb mirror, every single segment focuses separately. It's almost like all 18 segments are their own individual mirrors, individual telescopes. So the, the next thing we had to do is focus. And uh, the, uh, the focusing mechanisms are amazing. Uh, they can do large movements, 
But then they could also do tiny, super fine movements where you can actually change the shape of the telescope itself, the shape of the mirror to uh, about, if you take a human hair, about, about 1 20,000th the diameter of a human hair, tiny movements, almost a couple atoms. And so we, we can do large focusing and we can do tiny focusing. So the first thing that we had to do was the large focusing. So you see here that the mirrors after launch are gonna be in many different configurations. Okay, now we just try to find a star and line up the starlight on every single one. And you can see this in this animation, this is what we're going to do, what we have done now. So we need to get everything focusing to this the secondary mirror. This is the focusing mirror. And so the mirror segments will all be moved until every single one is pointing the starlight right at that central mirror. And then the, uh, the secondary mirror as well, we can change the shape of to make a perfect focus. So this is the first image that we took. And, and this is an image of, of a single star 18 times. <laughs> there are 18 images of this star out of focus. And, uh, but but the, the thing is that we, we were happy to see this because we knew that all 18 mirrors were roughly pointing in the right direction, right? One wasn't totally off somewhere else. And so the first image we took, we could see this star, 18 images. Now we move each segment until each star, again, the star is still out of focus, is in the center of each segment. Each segment is focusing to the secondary. But as you can see, every image of the star is different. Everyone is out of focus. Now we begin the very fine focusing. And so finally, after that, perfect. We had an absolutely perfect, sharp image of the star. But then when we looked at this image, this was, I mean, this gave us goosebumps. This gave, this made us excited. If you look beyond that star, those are galaxies. All of those little smudges behind the stars, those are actually very, very distant galaxies, you know, you know, galaxies that have hundreds of billions of stars. And this was a short exposure. This was just, you know, take a picture, make sure the focus is good. We hadn't even turned on everything correctly yet. And already we could see distant galaxies. So this made us, you know, catch our breath. Um, this is going to be a powerful observatory. And the, uh, we're, we're talking today, we actually had a meeting yesterday about when we will release the first public beautiful images from the telescope. And it, it's, it's either going to be at the end of June or the beginning of July. And um, you're going to be amazed. You're going to be amazed what we can see. Okay, so, so what are we going to look at? <laughs> well, um, there are major science goals of the Webb Observatory. There are also, uh, there's also going to be much, much time for any astronomer in the world to propose to use it. This is a public observatory. So uh, once a year, there will be a proposal call and uh, people will write in all around the world to ask for time on the telescope to, to do their own research with it. So the, uh, the, the first year of Webb has already been assigned. We already had our first proposal call. And there also are major goals that, that, that basically, you know, Webb as a public observatory will do for, for everyone to have the science. So the first thing that comes out in the next six months are uh, big observations that will be public to everyone. Everyone can see them immediately and use the data immediately. After that, uh, scientists will be able to propose to use the telescope. They get their data for six months. And after that six months, it is then public for everybody. The, the, the six months is because they wrote the proposal, they should get to publish the data, uh, but, uh, but they only have six months to do it. So, so all of the data that the, the Webb telescope will take will be archived and will be available for every scientist in the world to use free of charge. So here are the big science goals that we're going to do just in general. Um, I mentioned looking at the very earliest stars and galaxies looking so far away that we're looking back to about 200 billion years after the Big Bang. A, a, a big one, and I, I was just talking to our, our host before this, is understanding how giant black holes formed very early in the universe. Um, a black hole we know of you know, forms from a star that dies. 
That's the only thing in the universe we know of that is powerful enough to create a black hole. And yet in the very early universe, you know, only, you know, say 200 million years after the Big Bang, we see evidence of black holes that are millions of times the mass of the sun. How did they form so fast? You know, there's barely been any time for stars to form. So how, how did you get black holes that are millions of times the mass of the sun? That's a big question in astronomy right now. Um, the thing that I do research on uh, is uh, the cycles of, of birth and death of stars and, and planetary systems. So I'm a specialist on very massive stars that uh, go supernova and, of course, are responsible for the creation of the, the chemical elements of the universe. And then, uh, of course, investigating planetary systems, um, not, not just our own. We, we, we will be able to take pictures of any planet farther away than the Earth is. Because remember, we, we can't point in towards the sun. So we, we can't see Mercury and Venus or the Earth. The, the telescope would be destroyed. But we can see Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, you know, all, all the way out. Uh, we'll be looking at comets. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, objects in the Kuiper Belt, a very, very distant solar system. And we'll also be looking at the, uh, uh, the planets around other stars. And Webb is going to do some very exciting work about that. So I'll talk more about that later. So the thing that Webb can do that has not really been done before is it's powerful enough to, to study very well what the atmospheres of these planets around other stars are like. And th that, that could be very, very exciting. So talking about exoplanets, oh, I went through that a little bit fast. Um, this was actually just uh, from our website, at, one of our websites at NASA. I, I, I need a new one because I took this one like about a month ago. Um, you can see that we know of, of, of nearly 5,000 planets we've identified around other stars in the sky. And since I took this, this, this picture of our website, uh, it, it's now over uh, 5,000, oh, sorry, yeah, over 5,000 planets. And um, we now have more than 9,000 that we are trying to follow up on. The, uh, the way that we detect most of these planets is by something called transit, where the planet actually goes in front of the star. So it has to be lined up just right with our line of sight. And it goes in front of the star and blocks out some light from the star. And you see the star has a drop in light. And if that drop in light comes back in a pattern every time, then you know you have a planet. And we need to wait for this to come around three times to make sure that, that it's a planet going around. Because the, the starlight could drop because of a, a sunspot or, uh, or just because of something else getting in the way, going by, an asteroid, who knows. So um, we need to make sure this comes back in a pattern. And so because of that, there are stars that we're still waiting to see if, 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 if that pattern comes back three times. And, and this should tell you that we're, we're not very good yet at finding planets that are farther away from stars. So like the, take the Earth, right? The Earth goes around you know, once every year. So it would take at least three years to detect the Earth. But uh, Jupiter, you know, Jupiter goes around once every 12 years. So, I mean, that, that, that would take 36 years. And I mean, that's that's longer than we've known there have been planets around other stars. So most of the planets we've found so far are close to their stars. They go around quickly because they're easier to confirm. But th that doesn't mean there aren't more planets out there. We just need to do this for a longer time. So here's, here's what's going to happen. When a planet moves in front of its star, the light from the star will shine through the atmosphere of the planet. And different wavelengths of infrared can even tell us what's happening at different layers of the atmosphere. We'll, we'll actually be able to see whether the atmosphere is as warm as the Earth's, as thick as the Earth's. So that will give us some sense about whether some of these planets have, have Earth-like conditions. You know, just the temperature, the density of the atmosphere. But then it gets even more interesting because then we will use uh, spectroscopy. So spectroscopy, you take light, put it through a prism or a grating, break it up into a rainbow. And as you can see here, the rainbow will have different levels of light coming at different colors. And from this, you can see amazing things. So you know, this is a, a diagram of, of one of the things that we expect to see from these exoplanets. So again, the, the star's light shines through the atmosphere of the planet. We take a picture with Webb and by separating out the colors, and studying how much color comes in each, how much light comes in each color, 
there are uh, there are fingerprints, there are signals of which molecules are there. So uh, not just now the temperature, the density, now we can know if there's oxygen. Now we can know if there's water vapor. Now we can know if there's methane, ozone, carbon dioxide. And if you get all of these things together, you're talking about an environment that's likely to have life. Now, could we actually see a sign of the life itself, what we call a biomarker? A biomarker might be something like chlorophyll, you know, like a, you know, something that, that, that only life creates. Um, this is, it's unlikely, but it's not impossible. So I think that in the next few years, first step, we'll be able to point at stars in the sky and say that star has a planet that is much like the Earth. The atmosphere is the same temperature, it has oxygen, it has carbon dioxide, methane. There's a, a slim chance that we see something that is specifically based on life. And, and I mean, of course, that would be very profound. Um, I, I think that it'll be frustrating for a while. We'll probably see things where we're not really sure <laughs> if, it's, if it's life or not, but at least we'll know, we will know soon whether there are planets with similar environments to the Earth. One of the planetary systems we will focus on first, these are artists' conceptions, uh, is a, planet, uh, a planetary system called TRAPPIST-1. Um, TRAPPIST-1 has seven Earth-sized planets. And again, this is an artist's conception. We don't know what these planets are like yet, whether they have oceans or whether they're just clouds. But um, uh, we, we know that these planets are about the size and the mass and the density of Earth. So the, uh, it's amazing to think that this one system, we're going to have seven different planets that we can study the, the atmosphere of. And uh, this will just be one of our first targets. There are many more. Okay, now we talked about finding the very first stars looking so far away that the light has taken billions of years to, uh, to get to us. So, so say, you know, you know 13.6 billion years, the light has been coming towards us. There is a problem with seeing the very first stars. And, and that's because the gas between the stars in the very early universe was different than today. The very first generation of stars was very, very hot. And the creation of these giant black holes also created jets. And there was powerful radiation, x-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet light. And when the first stars turned on, it ionized the gas between the stars and the galaxies. Before that, the gas was what we call neutral. It was not ionized. There were electrons going around the nucleus of atoms. And when you have neutral gas with electrons in orbits around atoms, that absorbs light very well. Electrons will absorb the light and jump from one level to another, one energy level, but they'll take the light. So in the very early time, this is where you can see I'm pointing to, the gas is very hard to see through. There's nothing we can do about that. That's, that's the way the universe was 13.6 billion years ago. So the very first generation of stars ionized this gas, and that makes it easy for us to see up until, up until now. Okay, the, the, the gas between the galaxies is ionized. The electrons and protons are just free. They don't absorb light much, all good. So there's a transition and, and we don't know how far we're gonna be able to see into this reionization era. It's, it's almost certain that it was done in a patchy way, that there were some big clusters of stars that blew bubbles around them. And if we can happen to see into one of those, we can see farther in. So there's this time right here where the gas is changing from being neutral to ionized because that first generation of stars. And we have to be able to see into a part that's mostly ionized to see it. So this is, a, this is sort of where we're not sure if we'll see the first stars or not, but we hope. And uh, we can definitely see the very first galaxies begin to form. So that's, that's, where, that's where we're going. This is an artist's conception of that first generation of stars. You know, giant stars, maybe the stars were hundreds or even thousands of times the mass of the sun. And they blew up very quickly. They, they went supernova very, very fast. You, maybe even they, they never formed a stable star. You know, hydrogen gas just, just collapsed and blew up. And so if we can see into one of these giant clusters that is ionizing everything, 
we may be able to see this first generation of stars. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, uh, uh, the instruments and how they're going to study some of these very distant galaxies. You need to be able to look at a very, very tiny part of the sky if you're going to be looking at a galaxy billions and billions of light years away. And uh, this is one of our uh, ways of making sure that we can see exactly the, the galaxy that we want to look at. So this is one of the arrays, the instruments inside the Webb telescope. And each of these squares that you see here, so there's, there's one of these arrays, there's four of them. It's about the size of a postage stamp. So if you think about a postage stamp on an envelope, about that big. And you can see there are all these tiny little dots, the little black dots. Okay, what, what are those? Um, those are actually tiny, tiny little metal shutters that open and shut. And we use an electric current, just, just electricity and, and magnetism, and it opens and shuts. These little, these little tiny shutters. In each of these quadrants, there are 62,000 micro shutters, each one individually controlled. We can control each one. So 62,000 in a postage stamp. So that means that there are 248,000 of these micro shutters. And, and here's a, an actual picture of them under a microscope. So here are these tiny, tiny, tiny little metal shutter, shutters opening and closing. And uh, what that allows us to do is to very specifically select on the sky what we want to look at. Very distant, tiny galaxies, we can open and close the shutters so that only the light comes in from the galaxies we want to see. And so we can get very, very detailed observations of these little tiny, tiny things. I'm amazed that survived launch. I mean, how, how does that survive launch? So, you know, we also make it lucky, and this was a, uh, a result from the Hubble Space Telescope uh, about three weeks ago. This actually may be one of the first stars in the universe. Uh, you can see that there's an arrow pointing to a tiny little dot. And we believe that this dot is, is a star, not a galaxy. A star, it might be a binary star, it might be a, a, a system of stars but it's a very small bright object. And we're seeing it as it was 12.9 billion years ago. And the only reason we're seeing that, we shouldn't be able to see a star, even if it's a bright star. I mean, this, this star is about a million times as bright as the sun. It's probably about 50 times the mass of the sun and a million times as bright. But even so, it's so far away, we shouldn't be able to see it. And uh, what's happening is something called a gravitational lens. Now there's a, a nearer cluster of galaxies. All of these beautiful bright blobs you see here, those are galaxies. This galaxy cluster is much closer to us. We see it as it was about, about 9 billion years ago. So there's something much farther away than this cluster of galaxies, but the gravity of the cluster of the galaxies actually forms a natural telescope. It forms a telescope by bending space. Gravity, as Einstein said, is a bending of space. And so there happens to be a star perfectly lined up, just, just by coincidence, very, very far away, that's hitting this magnification due to this gravitational lensing. And so um, this star, we should not be able to see, but a gravitational lens helps us see it. And um, the, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope detected this star. The Webb Telescope will study it. It will, it, will, it will do very detailed studies about what this star is like. Um, we suspect this is not one of the very first stars, but maybe the first two or three generations of stars. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful thing that we actually managed to see that with the Hubble Space Telescope. And now Webb will follow. Okay, I want to turn um, just a little bit to some of the other things going on at NASA that I, I think are, are really amazing. And um, uh, this is actually a, a different uh, telescope that I'm going to talk a bit about called NICER. Uh, it's an acronym. It stands for the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. And it's an instrument that NASA has on the space station, the International Space Station. And it's a very small instrument about the size of a, uh, a washing machine. And uh, it times x-rays. It, it, it doesn't produce images like, like, like a photograph or, or an imaging telescope like Webb. It simply times when x-rays arrive. 
And we've been using it to study neutron stars, which are the, the dead cores of stars after a supernova explosion. Uh, this is an artist's conception of what a neutron star might look like. These objects are too small to actually resolve. You, you, you can't take an image of them. So, I mean, these objects are, you know, thousands of light years away. And they're only about, they're only about 20 kilometers across. So this is a, an illustration of a neutron star compared to the island of New York. So this is, uh, this is Manhattan here. This is Central Park <laughs> in New York. And uh, for very unfortunate people here in Queens, they're, they're on top, uh, they're below a neutron star, but that's okay. If a neutron star ever got this close to earth, the entire planet would be gone. But um, neutron stars are the collapsed core of a star before it explodes into a supernova. And they are hyper dense objects, unbelievably dense. Uh, to give you an idea of the density of these, uh, if you had a teaspoonful of neutron star material, so just you know, a teaspoonful of the material would have about as much mass as Mount Everest. And um, th that's incredible. They are incredibly massive. They are very, very hot, millions of degrees. And so they emit many x-rays. And uh, they also uh, usually rotate very fast. Uh, either rotation just from the collapse of the core, the angular momentum is conserved and they rotate, or sometimes there is a, a binary star around them that dumps material onto them that helps them rotate even faster. They are bizarre objects. And um, the, uh, the incredible thing about them is they have very, very strong magnetic fields. So, I mean, not just the, all of the mass of the star collapses. So a typical neutron star, 20 kilometers across, has the mass of, say, twice the sun. <laughs> so they, they are unbelievably dense. And their magnetic field, the magnetic field of the star also collapses. And so many neutron stars have huge magnetic fields. To give you an idea, uh, if you've ever been to a, a science museum and they have a big, strong magnet, and the children here, they're, they're playing with the magnet, making bridges with little bits of metal. Uh, that's, let's say, a one gauss. That, that's the unit, one gauss magnet. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field that protects us from the particles of space, about half a gauss. Uh, Jupiter's magnetic field is about four gauss. The, uh, the sun, depending on whether you're just talking the surface of the sun or whether there's a, a flare, like a big flare can get up to, say, 4,000 gauss, the magnetic field. Uh, if you're inside an MRI machine getting, you know, a scan, you're being exposed to about 10,000 gauss. So the average neutron star has a magnetic field of a billion gauss. I mean, think about that compared to the sun. You know, the, the strongest flare is on the sun, 4,000 gauss. An average neutron star, a billion gauss. And then there are some neutron stars, we call these magnetars, that have crazy magnetic fields. Um, 10 to the 17 Gauss. It, it's incredibly strong. It's, it's really about as strong as a magnetic field can get because the magnetic field, if you remember your Einstein, you know, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. There is so much magnetic energy that it begins to produce particles. It's so much energy that actually produces particles. It produces matter just from energy. And so the neutron, the, 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 the field really can't get any stronger. It just produces more mass. It, it, it's crazy. And um, a neutron star's gravity, if you were near a neutron star, about 200 billion times that of Earth's gravity. So these are amazing things. Um, the way they were detected is that the neutron star's magnetic field actually produces jets coming off the magnetic poles, jets of very high energy radiation but it's also has been detectable in radio wavelengths too. And they were detected in the 1960s because as a neutron star orbits, as it spins, I should say, as it spins, these jets go around the sky. And if one of these jets happens to face the earth and then goes away, that we, we see it turn on and off whenever the jet is facing the earth. So in this diagram, if this jet goes in the direction that earth is, we see this bright thing in the sky, that if it turns away, we see that jet turn off. And some of these neutron stars are objects in the sky that turn on and off hundreds of times a second. And uh, they were detected first in radio, 
uh, they were detected first by a young woman in England named Jocelyn Bell. And uh, Jocelyn Bell was a graduate student who was the first person that detected these. Uh, they, she, she called them a pulsar because they pulse. So a pulsar is a neutron star, but it's rotating and the jet of particles coming off the poles, we see that. And if we're in the right direction, we see that pulse. And so we call that a pulsar. Um, Jocelyn Bell is also unfortunately very famous for being somebody who should have gotten the Nobel Prize for that detection. But she was a, a young woman and they, uh, they did not give her the prize. And it's, it's one, of the, one of the shames of astronomy that uh, she very clearly detected something uh, very important, a huge discovery. She should have had the Nobel Prize, but she didn't get it. Now, neutron stars are very strange objects. So the density, you know, Mount Everest, you know, in a teaspoonful, they appear by our measurements of their rotation to have a solid crust. But inside, there seems to be some fluid. They kind of slosh as they, as they rotate. And this is all from studying the timing of the radiation coming from them. So the, um, this amazing idea that they actually even have seismic waves that go over this incredibly compressed crust. And I should say the reason we call these neutron stars, uh, I think a lot of you of course know, is that the gravity is so intense, it actually crushes the electrons into the nucleus of atoms. And so when you combine an electron and a proton, they become neutrons, neutral, electric and, and proton, they become neutrons. Um, a neutron star is not made up entirely of neutrons. It has some protons in it, some electrons. It, it also probably has material in its heart that may be composed of quarks. But the gravity even breaks down the neutrons and actually makes material out of the tiny particles, quarks itself. We do not know how to create this form of matter on Earth. There's nothing we have that can do this. So this is a new form of matter that we're studying. Neutron stars are important to us because they are unfortunately dangerous. I mean, of course the risk is low, but when, when you get movements in this crust, like we talked about seismic waves, there actually can be earthquakes. The earthquakes are tiny. The, 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 the crust will shift by a centimeter, but sometimes that creates an unbelievable amount of energy. So um, there was, uh, in 2004, there was what we called a star quake. And this was detected by several of our space telescopes. So there was a, this blast of high energy radiation, X-rays, gamma rays. And um, it actually blinded several of our satellites. And what happened was that the satellites that were actually observing the Earth's atmosphere saw part of the Earth's atmosphere blow away into space. And the magnetic field of the Earth started to ring the huge amount of energy was dumped into the magnetic field of our planet. Um, we actually traced in, in the sky the source of that radiation to a neutron star, a magnetar, with a very strong magnetic field. It was 50,000 light years away. From 50,000 light years away, the crust of a neutron star shifted a tiny amount and the energy was unbelievable. So the, the earthquake on the Richter scale equivalent of 23, <laughs> it's a logarithmic scale, right? So everyone is 10 times more, it's crazy. In 200 milliseconds, more energy was released than the sun creates in 250 million years. In 200, in 200 milliseconds, that little collapse released more energy than the sun makes in a quarter billion years. And this actually, the, the, the pulsar was rotating. So we actually saw this little burst come back about every seven and a half seconds for a while. Um, that's amazing. If, if one of these is closer to us and then we're unfortunately in the way of that, that burst of radiation, it could really damage our atmosphere. So um, this is a, uh, these are actual footages of the, uh, the, the instrument being taken out of a Dragon uh, a rocket, one of the SpaceX rockets, NASA buys those. And uh, here it is on the space station. This, this, this thing scans the sky continuously, looking for the timing of x-rays. And the, uh, the results are, are really amazing. So um, the first thing we found out is that the jets that come off a neutron star are not symmetric. They don't come off these nice, well-organized poles. 
Um, this is a, an animation. So as I mentioned, we can't take images of these. They're too small, they're too far away. But this animation is based on the timing of the x-rays. So this is based on the real measurements. And the hot spots that you see, for one, they're, they're not just spots. One is kind of smeared out in kind of a, a crescent shape. And uh, this is where the jets are coming from. And the jets aren't, aren't coming from nice poles. So neutron stars most likely have a very chaotic magnetic field. So you can see this is our modeling using a, a, a supercomputer of where the jets are coming. That's the blue lines coming off. And you can see that the, the, the magnetic field is very, very chaotic. We now know that the magnetic field changes. We, we, we now have observations where the jets even merge. We've seen the hot spots move around the surface of the, uh, the neutron star. So uh, these, are, these are very strange magnetic fields. And so the, the funny thing is we had to change our, our, our patch, you know, our mission patch. Like if you have a jacket with your mission patch, uh, for this mission, the, uh, when we first designed the patch, you can see we thought neutron stars had a nice e even magnetic field. You know, the, the jets came off, you know, on, on the poles. <laughs> no, no, we, we had to change it. So that the magnetic field is all out of whack and, and the jets are both coming off the bottom. Change your patch. So I'm going to show you a video of some of the findings uh, of, of the, these neutron stars. And we can, we can discuss this a bit afterwards. But as I mentioned, we're looking at a type of matter that we can't create here on Earth. We don't know how it behaves. Um, we don't know if the neutrons are able to stay intact you know, in the heart of the, of the star or whether they collapse into quarks. So there, there's a lot of things we're trying to figure out by these observations. So I'm going to I'm going to play this video and then we can we can end it after that. Matter at the heart of a neutron star, the crushed remnant of a massive sun, is on the brink of becoming a black hole. For decades, scientists have wondered about the properties of that matter, the densest in the universe we can measure, and what form it takes. Now they have new insights, thanks to NASA's NICER X-ray telescope on the International Space Station. Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> let me start that again. Uh, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to share my screen. That was my fault. I was trying to I was trying to uh, to do something. Hold on a sec. Okay. Share screen. Yes, yes. It says the browser can't capture the screen. Let's try that one more time. <laughs> luckily, luckily, this is my last thing. Uh, yes, uh, you using uh, the share screen. Yes, yeah. below. Let's do that. Let's try that again. Says it can't do that, so I'm going to try to do one more thing. Uh, using the, the, Hold on. Yes. The, the below, uh, Here we go. A neutron star <laughs> forms when a. Okay, sorry about that. Let's just start over. No problem. Matter at the heart of a neutron star, the crushed remnant of a massive sun, is on the brink of becoming a black hole. For decades, scientists have wondered about the properties of that matter the densest in the universe we can measure, and what form it takes. Now they have new insights, thanks to NASA's NICER X-ray telescope on the International Space Station. A neutron star forms when a massive star's core runs out of fuel. With nothing left to fight gravity, the star collapses. Here, protons and electrons crush together to form neutrons, as well as lightweight particles called neutrinos that escape the star. The core continues to collapse until the matter at its center has twice the density of an atom's nucleus, but on a city-sized scale. When the core can't compress further, it rebounds. The expanding core crashes into the star's collapsing inner layers, creating a shockwave that rips outward through the star. The result is a powerful supernova explosion with a newborn neutron star at its center. Scientists have many questions about neutron star physics, including how squeezable is the matter in their cores? 
In more squeezable models, the internal pressure and density break neutrons in the center into a sea of even tinier particles, or combinations of those particles, resulting in a squishy core and a smaller star for a given mass. In some less squeezable models, the neutrons hold up against those forces, resulting in a larger star. Scientists used NICER's precise mass and size measurements of two pulsars, a kind of rapidly rotating neutron star, to narrow down how compressible these objects are. A pulsar is so dense that its strong gravity warps nearby space-time, allowing us to see light emitted from its far side. This distortion makes it look bigger than it actually is. The more massive the pulsar, the greater the warping and the larger it appears. All right, I just want to I just want to to sort of pause here just so everybody understands what's going on. These objects have so much gravity in such a small area. We talked about how gravity can warp space. We talked about that that very distant star that was being seen because there was a natural magnification because of the, the gravitational arc, this gravitational uh, magnification. This is something only 20 kilometers across with so much mass. It bends light around it. So you can see the backside. You can actually see light coming from the backside of a neutron star. So that was part, let's go just back a tiny little bit. Okay, so you can actually see light from the back because it bends around because the gravity is so intense, it bends space and time. So that, that's an amazing idea. So one of the ways we're going to measure the mass of this neutron star is to see how much behind it we can see. Because the more massive it is, the more it will bend space and time. So for a very massive neutron star, we can see more of the behind side. So it actually appears larger to us. So I'll, I'll play that again. But what's happening here, and this is real, <laughs> is that these objects bend space and time around them. And so you can see the back as well as the front. And you can use Einstein's laws to figure out the mass. This time, allowing us to see light emitted from its far side. This distortion makes it look bigger than it actually is. The more massive the pulsar, the greater the warping and the larger it appears. Scientists measure this distortion by tracking the brightness of X-ray emitting hotspots on the pulsar's surface as it spins. They can then precisely determine the pulsar's mass and radius and obtain important clues about conditions in the core. NICER used this method to analyze J0740, the heaviest known pulsar with about 2.1 times the sun's mass. Two research groups using different approaches both estimate it's about 16 miles across. NICER's measurements of J0740 and Pulsar J0030 disfavor squeezable models where cores contain only quarks or other exotic matter. And J0740's size and mass together challenge less squeezable theories where cores contain only neutrons. Physicists will have to develop new models, perhaps containing both neutrons and quarks, to explain NICER's observations. The cores of neutron stars represent matter's final, stable form, short of becoming a black hole. Scientists can't recreate those conditions in Earth laboratories, so NICER will continue to measure pulsars to probe deeper and deeper into the hearts of these mysterious objects. Okay, now I can stop sharing. So um, the answer is we can't tell yet what that matter is like. You know, we, we had you know different models of how matter would behave. Some where the protons stand up and some where the protons go down to quarks. It turns out that the, the density of these, neither of them work. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting and kind of wonderful to be able to see something right in front of your eyes. I mean, neutron stars are real. We can observe them. And we don't have the physics yet to explain what's going on inside the cores. So there's a, and, and like we said, there's no way to create this on Earth. And that's probably a good thing because you, you would never want to create matter this dense on Earth. They would shoot right through the planet. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's to me, it's, it's amazing what we're going to be able to do in the very near future. You know, with the Webb telescope, you know, finding planets that have atmospheres very much like the Earth, maybe seeing the very first generation of stars turn on. For even smaller telescopes like NICER, you being able to, to really you know, begin to understand the, the, the most extreme forms of matter in the universe. 
And uh, I mean, just to give you an idea at NASA, um, I work in the science part of NASA. There, there, you know, there, there's sort of the astronaut part about human exploration, and then there's the the non-human exploration. All of the uh, the Mars rovers, the Hubble Space Telescope. That's the part that I work in. So the uh, the, the science part of NASA, we have more than 110 active missions, and uh, studying everything from Earth science and, and climate change out to the most distant galaxies. And uh, there's there's amazing information coming from from all of those. So it's a, it's a tremendous time to be alive scientifically. So 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 thank you so much for uh, for listening to me today, and uh, I'm happy to uh, to answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Michel, for an entering an entering uh, presentation on astronomy and James Webb Telescope. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now we can. Uh, Check some questions from uh, people and students here. Uh, the first question is, uh, what do you expect uh, from James Webb Telescope? So uh, yeah, so so as I mentioned, um, it, it's it's a public observatory, so it's going to be looking at many many things. So, you know, I mean, I I work on massive binary stars. And the, the, the stars have winds of particles that come off them. And the particles create big shocks between them, big shock waves. And these, these shock waves are responsible for creating a lot of the molecules that are very useful to us. Like for example, uh, the molecule water. There are, uh, there's one system in, in the Orion Nebula, two, two giant stars with a shock between them. And the shock wave is creating enough water to fill the Earth's oceans 60 times in one day just keeps pumping out molecules of water. Um, people are going to use this for many, many things. So some of the things I'm most looking forward to, um, definitely the atmospheres of exoplanets. You know, so, so look at that star in the sky. That star has an Earth-like planet. That will be able to tell. We, we, we may not be able to tell you whether there's life or not, but we'll be able to say it has an atmosphere just like the Earth's, right? I, I think that, that will happen. And I think that we'll be able to say, well, that one has an atmosphere like Venus, and that one has an, an atmosphere like Mars. So pretty soon, the sky is, is going to be full. I mean, we, we know that there are planets around other stars, but now we can say what the planets are like. I think that will be wonderful. Um, I, I am very much looking forward to seeing those very distant first stars and those first black holes. Because the, the mystery of how you get black holes to form that quickly and, and that huge tells me that that first generation of stars was very different than the stars we see today. Again, that they must have been gigantic and, and very close together so they could all collapse to form these huge black holes. So that's something that I'm, I'm looking forward to a lot. And the, but there's, there's so many other things. I mean, you know, I, um, uh, Webb will be able to do better measurements of these, these interstellar comets that come in. I mean, we, we now are finding these comets that are coming in on trajectories, that means they're from outside our solar system. So, you know, Webb will be able to take better chemistry, better measurements of them, see what conditions are like in other solar systems. I think that would be lovely. So there, there, there's so so many things that Webb will be looking at that I'm looking forward to. So, thank you. Uh, the second question is, uh, what is the past limit uh, that can James Webb see? Yes. So. Um, this all depends on exactly how far that reionization happens. So, you know, the, um, we can see as, as far as we can, but then the gas between the galaxies eventually becomes very opaque, very difficult to see through. And, and that's because, you know, after the Big Bang, things cooled down. And, and so as long as you have that cool gas, it, it absorbs light, it, light it gets absorbed. You, you can't see into that area very well. And then those first generation of stars, all of that brightness heated up that gas and, and, and made it more transparent. So exactly when that happens is something we don't know. And so we, we, we hope that we'll be able to see back to a time about 200, 200 million years after the Big Bang. And, um, the, the farthest back that any telescope has seen is the microwave background radiation. That, that radiation comes from about 100,000 years after the Big Bang. But that, that's a different measurement. That's in microwaves. 
and um, the the microwaves are are you know, we we don't have a, a detailed map, just just a basically a big general map of the sky. So there there that's the first light that we can ever see, because if you go any far back in time, if you look any further out, you're looking back to a time when the whole universe was opaque. Uh, the whole universe was as hot and dense as the surface of the sun. So so that's that's amazing. I mean we we actually have an instrument. It was called the W map. The Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, kind of a mouthful. Um, the, the, the WMAP uh, satellite could actually see that radiation from that time. But uh, the Hubble Space, sorry, the Webb Space Telescope won't see that far back, but it'll see in much better detail. And so that, that will give us about, you know, about, about 200 million years after the Big Bang. Thank you. Uh, first question is, how long uh, time will it take to get data from James Webb Telescope? Oh, so the, the nice thing is the James Webb Space Telescope has a continual uh, radio link with the Earth. So the, the telescope is out four times as far away as the moon. But that in, in light travel time, that's, that's not much. That's you know, half a second or something. <laughs> and so the, uh, we're able to actually download the data continuously. So um, I showed you some of the images that we got from just our, our focusing. And, um, you know, so, so the nice thing is the information comes back immediately. Uh, I mean, we, we, are, we are right now taking our first data and our first images. And, uh, and then we're going to take some time calibrating and, and cleaning up the images, making sure everything is right. And then we'll release them in just a couple months. And then after that, you'll, you'll, it'll just continuously be coming. So the, 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 the convenient thing about the design is because the heat shield is always facing away, the, 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 the antenna is always facing towards the Earth, so we can just continuously upload our data, yeah. So, so immediately. I mean, as soon as the data is back and as soon as we have a chance to calibrate it, you'll see it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, question is, uh, what is the difference between the neutron stars and quark stars? Yeah, so um, that's a big question right now. So. Um, a neutron star, of course, we call that because the gravity crushes the electrons into protons and it forms a lot of neutrons. Uh, but does it go further? Does, does the, do the neutrons get crushed into quark? And that's what we don't know. That's what that, that, that video was about, that when we actually look at the volume and the mass of neutron stars, it doesn't look like either it's purely one or the other. It, it looks like a combination of both. So there are probably some neutron stars that are more massive that have more of a quark material and some that are less massive that have more neutrons and there appears to be kind of a mess a combination and we don't have a way to describe that matter we we, we don't know what particles are like when you have neutrons and protons and quarks free free interacting so um, your answer as to whether these are neutron stars or quark stars, it, it's going to be a, a, a spectrum. It's going to be a bit of a bit of it all, and uh, and that's a surprise to us. So we, we may find some that are more quark material, some that are more neutron material, and everything in between. Thank you. I don't know if you have any more questions. Uh, oh. And if not, I will uh, <coughs> say goodbye and get on. I have a couple meetings I need to get to later on today. So uh, I know it's uh, it's evening time for all of you, but it certainly has been wonderful to to talk to you all. I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> I can't hear anybody. Well, if you can hear me, I will uh, head off. And uh, it was, what, again, wonderful to talk to you all. Have a great evening. Nice to, nice to be here. Bye. Oh, there's Mustafa.
I think I'll, I'll head off. <laughs> so thank you so much. Here, I'll, I'll put this in the chat. Thank you again, Dr. Michel, for uh, this excellent presentation. Uh, thanks for following. Uh, let me again, uh, again next time for you and for another presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a problem with the connection and uh, uh, 
Oh, uh, no, no, no problem at all. Very so sorry for that. Uh, so kidding. thank you very much for the uh, pre presentation. Uh, uh, so uh, <clears throat> you can hear me now? You can hear yes, me now? Yes, I can hear you, yeah. Uh, uh, we just, uh, I have uh, a last question. <laughs> uh, last, last question, so we can, uh, that, I suppose that uh, what is, <clears throat> was, what is the question uh, that James Webb answered? Oh yeah. Well, as I said, there's you know, there's so many different ones. I mean, there there are some people that are going to use it to study the uh, the changing of the seasons on Jupiter and Saturn, and and how the how the how the you know the clouds form above the volcanoes on Mars. So we've got you know we've got planetary science programs. Um, you know, some people wonder if there's another giant planet farther out in our solar system that we haven't found yet. James Webb may help uh, to follow up on, on on that sort of thing. You know the ideas of of how do uh, how do stars and planets form inside these clouds that I showed you a picture of. You know, I mean, it just it, you can just keep on going from from near near to the far. You know, other solar systems, you know, our own galaxy. Uh, I know that um, Mustafa here is studying the way galaxies rotate. You know, I'm, I'm sure there'll be some data from Webb that will be useful to him about that, and uh, you know, all the way out to how the galaxies and stars form. So the like I said, this is this is a very general telescope. It's not made with one specific question. So, like for example, the the the, the nicer telescope with neutron stars that was a very narrowly focused science question. You know, what are neutron stars like? The uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is far more general. So there are many many questions it will answer. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, uh, for this presentation and for this uh, answer on this question. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and welcome on Morocco and, uh, and Arab <laughs> world. I would love that. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Moroccan food. So I, I, I really, really have to come to, uh, to Morocco someday. I, I, you know, absolutely, yeah. Thank you, you guys have a good day. Thanks, thanks very much, thank you.